Final speaker of the day will be John Anderson. Uh, John's originally from Idaho, still resides there with his wife and children. Uh, John was raised at Seagull Bay Holsteins. That was his family dairy in American Falls, Idaho. He uh, graduated from uh, BYU and now is the dairy manager of Artema Group uh, in uh, Jerome, Idaho. They milk over 26,000 cows on seven different operations. And uh, the largest is Double A Dairy, uh, which milks about 13,000 cows. And John will be uh, telling you uh, today how he's using ge genomics in our programs to increase value in his operation. And uh, now John will talk or show you how he's applying genomics in his herd. Uh, thanks a lot for coming today, John. system we've had for 
over four years now. That's obviously an important part of our operation. Uh, this is, I have the easy job. I just have to hire these five guys. They take care of everything else. Um, or these six guys, I should say. Uh, we have Matt Quinnell, that's our, our head herdsman. He has his master's in reproduction. Uh, he has about uh, 12 or 13 guys that work with him. Brandon Anderson has been with us for the years. Uh, he's over all of our transition cows, uh, fresh cow facility, and our calving facility. Brian Slides over all of our feed inventories for all of our dairies. Uh, Jordan Artema is over our farming operation as well as our manure management. <coughs> Roberto Barraza has been with us for eight years, started as a milker. He's now uh, the milk partner manager. He has three assistants and he manages about 85 people total that underneath him. And then Bakuro Zur is our head veterinarian. Um, does a lot of the preg checking, catching problems, and now he's doing a lot of regular transfer work as well. Um, so these are the guys that make things run on a daily basis. Uh, I was asked to just briefly give you an idea of what our sire selection criteria is. Um, I should preface this with, I don't plug these numbers into a uh, into a computer program and it spits out the bowls we're going to use. But as I look at the bowls, most of this stuff is in my head. Um, but as, as I look at the bowls that we use on a regular basis, pretty much all of them fit into this. I did, did plug this in uh, to dairy bowls after I put it on paper. And uh, pretty much all the bowls that we use came up on the list. So there, currently with the two studs that we buy the majority of our semen from, there were about uh, 50 bowls that came up on this list currently, and there were five or six on this approval side of this. So you will notice the difference, um, and after listening to some of the presentations already, you probably know why we have a difference there. Uh, not necessarily there's a huge difference in these bowls. Uh, we, do, we do feel like we use, have used the top end of the proven bowls over the last seven years. Um, in our herd currently, we're milking you know, six or seven hundred shadow daughters. We milked a thousand bollivers at one point. A lot of diehards. Uh, we're milking a lot of Jeeves right now. Um, and then our young heifers coming up are, are some of the top bulls in the breed. So we, we do put a lot of emphasis on the genetics in our herd. We feel like we've seen a big difference over the last number of years when the herd looks like and how it's performed. Uh, you know, we do, you'll notice milk is in there. Uh, we don't want to go backwards on milk. Not using negative milk bowls. Most bowls we use are, are at least 600 pounds of milk, especially in the proven bowls, and a little higher in the genomics. Uh, we look at productive life, net merit, somatic cells, an important one to me. Uh, we feel like we see a real correlation with that, uh, how long the cows stick around. I think that's got a big impact on the productive life. So if, if a bowl is 2.82, that doesn't mean we won't use it. Uh, there's not any one of these. Uh, any one of these criteria is going to keep the ball off of our list, but if he's good enough in other areas, we'll put him off. Uh, other composite foot legs. <coughs> so how are we using genomic testing on our operation? And I guess as, as we thought about this and tried to decide how we wanted to approach it, um, I think one thing that was mentioned earlier that I think is important, you've got to have a plan for how you can use that information. Uh, if you don't, it really doesn't do any good. I've got a lot of friends in managing areas and they like to see, you know, 8,000 reports on a desk every morning with every single number of what's happened over the last 24 hours. We don't run exactly like that. Um, I tell the guys that work with me, if it's not information we're going to do something about, when we get it, we don't need it. And so we try and limit the stuff to just things we're going to act on once we get that information. So. As we try to decide how we're going to use the genomics, the first half is we genomic tested in the commercial herd. I have genomic quite a few of my own registered animals, so I had some experience with it. But the first animals we, we tested in the commercial herd we did because we had an operation that wanted to purchase some pre breeding heifers, a semi load of them. They wanted genomic tested. And they were going to take a certain number of ones over a, over a certain number, and we were going to we weren't going to let them take over a certain. We kind of had a window there they could take them. Well, they got impatient, not realizing once we took the test, you know, it was four to six weeks before we got information. So they said, hey, can we just take them? They said, well, they're taking the risk of taking some low ones as well as high ones. So they took the whole semi load. We got the results back. There are a couple of heifers, well over 800 net merit. 
Um, and we said, hey, we may have something out there that we need to find. So currently we've done about 330 heifers. Um, all those heifers that have been done are between, you know, 13 months right now and 18 months. So there's some are older heifers. Uh, we're going to look at some information from 275 of those heifers that are still on our, our operation. Um, we do, how did we decide which heifers to test? I told you our, we are doing a basic ID on all the heifers now. In fact, the entire herd is basic ID. So we were able to pull up a PTPI, a parent average on the TPI, and we took heifers that were over 1750, so they were the higher end heifers, tested those. And, uh, and that's, how, that's how we came up with that. We're not, if I had a whole bunch of heifers to sell right now, we'd probably be looking for bottom end heifers to ship across to Turkey or Russia or wherever it might be. Uh, that's not our situation right now, so we're trying to identify some of the higher end, and that's why we're probably at the, at the time only going to test 15 or 20% of the heifers rather than more, more than that, because we're not currently looking for the bottom end. Although we'll find some of the bottom end. Um, we're doing the 3K test, or now the 6K test, as they, which is the lowest one. We do it with the ear punch system, which works really well for us, especially since we dock tails. Uh, the first group we did, we tried to pull hair on a bunch of heifer, 100 heifers that didn't have tails. That wasn't fun. Uh, so there is a there is an ear punch out there now that is just an all flex tagger with a little tube that takes a, a tissue sample. It's just like put an ear tag in, you've got your sample, it's really easy, you don't you just do it right for, in front of the heifers. Uh, and we can do 100 heifers in about 30 minutes, it's pretty quick. So as, we, as, I, as I was mentioning before, how do we justify this? There is an expense to it. You've got to, you've got to have a plan in place to recoup those costs. Uh, there are, there's bull studs out there right now that are, their goal is to test 3,000, you know, test 3,000 bulls bring 120 of those bulls into their stud every year. They know that the more bulls they test, the better chance they have to find the, the high ones. Well, we have a pretty genetically diverse herd with a lot of different sire stacks, uh, different from a lot of the bulls that are available out there. Uh, and we have a lot of animals to test. And so that's why we decided to take a crack at some of those higher animals. Uh, we are identifying, we're trying to identify the top five or 10% of the herd and we're going to continue to utilize some flushing and IVF work uh, to accelerate the genetic product progress on our herd. And as you all know, in 2013, we'll also be able to test our own bulls. So we'll have a lot of bulls that are 97, 98% registered. To me, as a commercial dairyman, I have no problem using those bulls. Um, but we want to we want to identify them and have an opportunity to do that. And so that's why we're starting now to. Uh, get some animals caught up, get them tested. Uh, we feel like, obviously, none of these animals we can justify doing IVF work at two to $4,000 a head. That doesn't make sense. And if you're gonna do it through Tanzova, that's what it's gonna cost you. Uh, we have trained our on-farm vet to collect oocytes. Uh, we've identified a lab that does a lot of in vitro fertilization. And we feel like we can put, uh, put those embryos in at no more than cost to buy sex semen. So we feel like we can make female pregnancies or female and male pregnancies from those top heifers, uh, put them into cows, uh, and make a pregnancy for no more than cost to buy sex semen. And you can ask me a year from now, ask me how that's going. All right, this is uh, just some information I put together off the 275 heifers that have been genomic tested are still in our herd. These heifers are all, uh, you know, they'll all calve in the next year. Uh, they're not the, the youngest heifers. So this column here is what their genomic, average genomic test of the 275 heifers was. The next one is what their T, uh, PTPI score was. One thing you'll notice, and this actually was something I didn't really expect to see. The averages of the group are practically identical. There's not much difference there. Now the ranges, and, and bear in mind all these heifers had a, a traditional TPI of over 1750. 
So you can see the range is from 1324 up to 2315 on TPI and net merit 114 to 798. And you can see, if I could have put everything in here, you would have seen similar ranges on all of these trades. Now what was even more interesting in this, this one I can understand. What was even more interesting is I took the top of 20 heifers uh, on GTPI rank. And this would be this column right here, one through 20. This is their G, uh, GTPI score. And then this was their previous rank on a parent average. Out of those 20 heifers, only three of them ranked outside of the top 20 on, on parent average. That really surprised me. I expected to see more movement than that. You can see one heifer that was ranked 127 that came all the way up to number nine. That was the biggest movement we had upward. Um, but you can see 127, 30, and 22. So these two heifers weren't even that far out of the top 20. But a large variation. So we're all the way from 2091 up to 2315 on the top 20 heifers. Uh, uh, when you did these genomic tests, um, I assume the accuracy of the parentage was 100%. Yes, that's a good question. I'll, I'll touch on it later. But when you do the genomic test, it's going to tell you if they, the sire is not correct or the dam sire is not correct, you're going to get a call from Holstein or whoever you're in the test with. And they're going to say, hey, you had X number. Of these samples can't be right. So obviously, in our cabin facility, our goal is to be 99% accurate. We, we thought we were pretty close to that. As we've done these tests, we've been 90% accurate. So about 10% of those have come back and they've said, hey, most of the time, what we found is, it's not the guys in the cabin barn. We've really hounded on them constantly over the last number of years. So we want the right calf matched with the right cow. We want them tagged immediately. If we're going to keep all this information, we want it to be right. Um, and we found out they're doing a pretty good job because where we were wrong, when we were wrong on those 10%, that the maternal line was correct, but the sire was a sire. another sire we were using at that same time. It was just a different bull. And so we're able to correct that and say, okay, we were using that bull, switch the sire to that bull, and run it. And they do that for us. So uh, I've heard numbers out there. I think the average, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, I've heard 75% accuracy has been kind of the norm uh, on all the genomic tests they've been running. I've seen 80 and some of those that so obviously we've met, we've tried to take some measures with our breeders and different recording things to try and push that number up from the 90%. Uh, we'd like to see that closer to 100. Uh, there were number of bulls representing this list of top 20 on the TPI. There's eight different sires uh, represented on that. Um, I do have a, I can give you just an idea of what the bulls were that were on that. So on the TPI, uh, Super, Garrett, Freddy, Dorsey, Trigger, Time, Sebastian, Surge. There's some proven sires and genomic sires on there. Um, ten of them were Garrett's. So, um, but we use more of him than the other bulls, so that would make sense. And he's a proven sire. Same list, just with net merit. Same story. Uh, we had three, three animals that ranked outside the top 20. Uh, that actually moved in the top 20 when they got their genomic test. Uh, these were represented by just five different sires. Uh, and then 14 of the heifers were on both lists. So 14 of the top 20 for net merit and TPI were, were represented on both lists. Any questions before we move on from this? So three came out of the top 20. How far down did the three that are there? Yeah, how yeah far and I did look at that. They didn't move way down. I mean, they were still in the top 40. Yeah. Yeah. So, we talked about identification. That's one thing that uh, we really tried to correct a number of years ago. We built our centralized cab facility. Uh, we cab animals for all the AA, and this facility is located really close to AA. We also cab for one of our Jersey dairies and another Holstein dairy that are pretty close to AA. So, there's about 17,000 milk cows that the calf through this facility. We average about 50 to 60 calvings a day through this. What it allows us to do, we have all of the dry cows from far off drives all the way through close ups. We calve the cows and then they go back to the dairy within 24 hours. Uh, it allows us to have a crew that just focuses on transitioning cows and taking care of calves in that first 24 hours. This is just inside the barn. 
there's a there's a lane that goes outside this barn about a quarter mile down. And there's close-up pans on each side of that. There are 125 cow pans that have shades in them, and we have heifer separate from cows. And during the summer, we really don't even use this inside building hardly at all. When the weather's nice, we'll let the cows, unless they have a problem, calf out on the dirt lot. And as soon as they calve, we bring the cow and the calf out. During the winter, we try and get them up there after we start the calf. Just to, this is our processing center. We've got four different stalls here. We've got some telescoping gates that we'll hook in here, load all four stalls, move the gates out of the way, and then we'll process the cow, take a milk sample, anything we're giving the cow in our fresh cow protocol, uh, and we'll collect first colostrum. You can see the vacuum line that runs above here. We actually have milk in the buckets, and we have a cooling tank where we pull that colostrum, and then every day when the pepper cows get picked up, collect that cluster and goes to our calf ranch, gets pasteurized, tested, supplemented. We need to package individually and it comes back to us to use. It's just we have two bays just like this. We have a heifer bay and a bull bay. Uh, within the first, those calves get tagged immediately and then we get them colostrum within the first 45 minutes, uh, get them branded, and then within 24 hours they're a calf ranch. So with that, I kind of rushed through that fairly quickly, but I want to leave some time if anybody has any questions. Um, this is obviously, this is my pride and joy, 88 point shuttle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking, my kids are the picture too. <laughs> obviously, they're the main reason I still, I love registered Holsteins and genetics, um, and I do that as a hobby. I have triple crown genetics, but uh, those cows, we're a pretty big operation. It's hard to have the kids out there with me very often. They're riding around the truck at times, but uh, we do a little showing and gives the cows a chance to upraise the kids. So.